that's a hard act to follow. But I want to start with reading a section of my own journey to discover who Neil was and who what Jay calls the Neil Agate generation, but it could have been by it was to me the generation that followed ours. And my husband Nanda said it very well. I think at the day yesterday, he said after Ravonia trial, there was a bushfire. It was a bushfire. And what happens with the next generation, the new shoots coming up. So let me introduce you to the Neil I've been discovering. I think I'll read you just a very small snippet of Neil when he was visiting Europe. Um, and he wrote to his mom um, a number of letters from Paris. And you're just going to hear the voice of that young man in 1975. I think he was trying to live the life of a young artist, living in a garret somewhere in Paris. There were holes in the windows, and the wind came in. It's difficult to describe the kind of life that I am leading here. It is a solitary existence, with not many external events, but rich in subjective experience. On Christmas night, I stood for a while in a beautiful church, listening to some singing and looking out over the lights of Paris, with all the ponds frozen, one appreciates to a far greater extent the beauty of flowing water, its infinite variety, clarity and purity. The ice looks so dirty and coarse, though it's different when it hangs in icicles from the fountains. We only had that one cold period of snow, only for about 10 minutes, but now it's starting to get cold again, so we may be in for another smell. Spell. That is Neil in 1975. He comes back from Europe and he decides that his future is in South Africa. And he comes to do his second half of his internship up in Tembisa. A new brotherhood. On the day that Biko died of multiple head injuries on the floor of a cell in Pretoria Central Prison, 12th of September, 1977, Neil started work at Tembisa Hospital. He had found a small house to rent on the flat Highfeld, not far away, but halfway house, now Medrant, off the road north to Pretoria. It was a remote, old Transvaal farmhouse with a tin roof that sloped down over the front stoop. Inside, there was very little furniture, and as in his mountain retreat, no electricity, although there was a coal stove. The high felt was very different to the forests above Constantia, in a small way more akin to the Kenyan bush of Neil's childhood. Whatever the practical reasons for living near to Tembisa, the little farmhouse was a lonely spot. At the same time, he clearly welcomed bumping in to the older brother of his friend Neil Anderson and the chance of new relationships. On his first visit to Neil at Halfway House, Gavin commented on a poster on the kitchen wall. It showed a Sandinista woman with a gun. His brother's medical school friend was no, clearly no longer just the hell of a nice guy and rugger bugger of those early university days. What if, Gavin asked Neil, the security police were to come checking up on the young white man living in a farmhouse by himself near Tembisa and saw this picture. Neil took the poster down. Annie Smythe, the young teacher who lived with Gavin and his partner Nicky and who was the only person with a car at the time, did much ferrying, recalled another picture in Neil's kitchen that initially made her suspect that Neil came from a tradition of real ultra-leftism. It showed members of the Bader Meinhof gang who had recently been found dead in their German prison cells after the failure of a plane hijacking that was designed to secure their release. The word murdered was written in large red letters. Many people on the le left rejecting the official version and believing that the prisoners had been killed. This was another picture that had to come down. 
Rather than dismissing Neil as naive, Gavin warmed to his romanticism and idealism and watched to see how Neil responded to advice. Gavin had learned from seeing how core union members in a factory would carefully test out potential new recruits in order to ensure that they weren't management informers. The prospective member would be drawn into conversation at different times, first with one core member, then another. Afterwards, their responses would be discussed and carefully analysed before a decision was taken as to whether to invite them to join the union. The process was slow, but it helped to build a strong, reliable core in each factory. However much Gavin warned to Neil, he still needed to be cautious, and he also needed SIPO to sound him out. With banning orders forbidding contact between banned persons, Gavin and Sipo Kuberga were prohibited from speaking to each other. Both Gavin and Sipo regarded them as a challenge in testing their ingenuity to meet once a week for a couple of hours. At the same time, they were careful. When Sipo first met Neil at Gavin's place, what impressed him immediately was that Neil did not want to go into the army. This was in contrast to white comrades who excused their army service by saying they'd done office work or activity that didn't involve them in the townships or on the border. But here was a comrade who was actually moving around so that he's not found and deciding to lead an abnormal life. Later, as their friendship grew, Sipo introduced Neil to his family. Like Gavin, and unlike most white South Africans, Neil was thoroughly comfortable coming into a black township, day or night. He would visit Sipo and his wife Tandi and their two daughters and Alexandra, where they shared a yard, one tap and one toilet, with more than a dozen other families. One night, while they were sitting and talking, Neil's car parked outside the yard was stolen. It was a major problem. A white man in Alexandra Township at night, no transport out. Sipo had to accompany his friend to the outskirts of Alex, from where he was able to hitch a lift back to town. But the experience did not deter Neil from future visits to a family with whom he felt at home. To Sipo, Neil was always strikingly humble. The agates were part of my childhood consciousness. They were our family up north, settlers on land beneath Mount Kenya, living through the Mama Rebellion, the ultimate colonial nightmare. Neil's father brought my cousin Joy and the family to South Africa at independence. They arrived during the Ravonia trial. Neil was 10. I never got to meet them, and the following year, I left the country. In time and tragic circumstances, Neil's parents would discover the bitter irony of their decision in choosing the apartheid state as a safe haven. Within this book, there are layers of transformation, the central one being that of Neil himself. You know, those of us in exile knew actually very little about the generation of activists that followed ours and who continued the liberation struggle from within the country, laying the basis for civil society through democratic union movement, as Jay has spoken of. But through writing this book, I have come to appreciate Neil and the generation of activists who followed ours. It's been necessary to dig deep, to penetrate silences and some myths. When I began my interviews back in 1995, I had no idea that it would take so many years before I could undertake the solid task of writing. However, the passage of time and events has meant a longer view on the significance of the vision of a just society held by Neil and his comrades. I have many people to thank. Sitting right in front of me, George Bezos, 
I offer a very special thank you to you for your passionate commitment to justice and to all those in part of the team who brought out so much in that inquest. And, you know, that passionate com commitment shone through in our interview in Oxford 30 years after the inquest and in the forward that you've written. Thank you. Thank you, George. And when I say George, you actually symbolise all those who've worked so hard in those terrible years to bring up that injustice. There are so many people who've assisted in this book, some of whom are also here this evening. Sadly, the only member of Neil's immediate family to see his biography come to fruition is his sister Jill, who's here tonight. Thank you, Jill, with her husband, Paul. And when I proposed the possibility of a book to Neil's still grieving parents in 94, with the proviso of my complete independence, they were courageous enough to go along with the idea, not knowing what I would find. I'm hugely grateful to all those who dug into memories, including some, indeed many, that were very, very painful. I'm just going to mention a few of the people who are here. David Dyson, who Aubrey Agate asked to give me the, the dockets from the inquest, and who I then discovered not only had been a lawyer, but had been Neil's friend, and was able to offer me that first inroad and insight into the generational and the person Neil had become. Liz Floyd, thank you, Liz. Sipo, Sipo Kobega, thank you so much for coming and talking about me and helping me understand. Many of you had to explain over and over and over again to get into the head of this exile what it was that you'd actually been going through. Israel Mohadla, sadly not here today, but whom Neil became a mentor to. Um, his letters reminding me, where is this book about my comrade? Were terribly important reminders that this book needed to be written. Yvette Breitenbach, now over there in Tasmania, thank you, email. Barbara Hogan, to whom I'm enormously grateful for passing over documents and talking to me so honestly about that period, terrible period. Cesar Jekalana, just to name some of those who are in my acknowledgements. I do hope in my full acknowledgements I have not omitted anyone. I owe special thanks to Eddie West, who in 1995 gave me some of his photographs. He'd even forgotten that he'd given them to me. <laughs> Including his wonderful image of the vegetable gardeners. <laughs> That's, you know, I blue tacked up above my desk. And, um, I also want to thank Brian Sandberg, who pushed me to understanding in the nicest and gentlest way, to understanding more about Neil's childhood and his years at Kingswood College. And that certainly led me into a deeper understanding, a period that I'd perhaps taken a little bit for granted. But there's someone here without whom, I have to say this biography could never have been written. Neil's close buddy and comrade, Gavin Anderson. Gavin, your absolutely unflagging support, answering every probing email, patiently explaining, sometimes re-explaining. That support was truly tremendous. I know at one point when I came back here, you said, oh, I'm glad you're on the aeroplane, going away. <laughs> but you still answered when I came back to you you know, years later, and it was actually meeting you in Rosebank and thinking, if I don't do this now, I'm going to lose this. The point at which I realized it had to be a biography. I couldn't write another novel about this because you real guys were too real. Your, the stories I began to hear in transcribing these, you know, these interviews, they were so riveting 
that I wanted to know more about the real people, so it could not be a novel. And I had to put it aside until I had the time to devote to doing it as a proper, you know, a biography, checking, checking, double checking. My deep thanks go to Luli and Eddie Webster for providing us Naidus, not just one of them, but all of us, with a home in Joburg, with so many conversations. And to Maren Wodenstein for your writer support and to Merv with your Michalisberg air. Thank you, Maya. Where are you? Thank you, Maya. Daughter Maya, for coming out from London to see the end of this journey, which you assisted at the very beginning. Transcribing interviews, going and doing a bit of research for me. And thank you, Nanda, you are somewhere here, for so surviving this journey, so patiently. And almost last but not least, I'm not sure if he's here, Chris van Veek, for your poem, In Detention. Of course I read it many, many, many years ago. Of course it's implanted itself, just as like it's implanted itself in so much deeply in our consciousness. I saw a young lady in an exclusive books the other day and I asked her this poem and I started reading it to her and she said, I read that at school. <laughs> so I continued reading it until she was you know, I told she could hear she was really listening. And she knew then it was for real. This wasn't just history there. It's living. And that poem was blue tacked above my desk, spurring on my writing. And finally, my many thanks go to everyone working at or with Jonathan Ball Publishers, who have really pushed me to make this book its very best. And I'm deeply grateful to you all. And thank you, Jane, for coming to launch it. Finally, I'm going to give the last word to Neil. I want to end with an extract from a letter that he wrote to his mother towards the end of his first medical internship in Ontato. It's dated 15th of June, 1977 the eve of the first anniversary of the Soweto uprising, three months before starting work at Tenbisa Hospital and finding that isolated farmhouse to rent in the felt. And this is what he wrote at the end of a letter to his mom. I am always grateful for the love and care that you gave me as a child. But at some point, I had to evaluate the world from an independent perspective and make my own decisions. I am sorry for all the hurt I have caused you, but I am sure that you realize I am not standing against you or the family in particular, but against the whole social order. Stay well. Yours, Neil. Thank you.